Uh, Open your Bible with me to the second chapter of the Gospel according to John. The second uh, chapter of John, and we're going to begin in verse 23. Would you stand with me in the honor of the reading of the Word of God, if you can? If you cannot, if you, you feel free to be seated. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe them, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into, has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man." As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Pray with me. Father, as we open your word, it is with a sense of expectation, a sense not only, Lord, that we will hear the word preached, but that it will speak to us. And even though we know this text, and even though this text is familiar to every believer, Lord, there's always something more for us to learn. Speak to us through your spirit today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're in a series entitled Building Blocks, wherein We are seeking to gain a clearer understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, what it is God wants us to be, and out of that being, what He wants us to do. Now, not only is that important for every person to comprehend individually, because each person must be born again, but as Christians, individually, and as a church, we need to be clear, crystal clear, on what it means to be born again and why it's so important that we must be born again. What I want to do this morning is I want us to walk through this text together and then I want us to make some observations with a view towards application. Here in the final part of John chapter 2 we find Jesus continuing his ministry in and around Jerusalem. He's just finished cleansing the temple which was one of the signs that he's the Messiah and on account of these signs, on account of these miracles and, and works that he's doing, many people believe in him. But the, there's a very interesting thing here. The text says that while, people, while he, people believed in him, he did not entrust himself or believe in them. The reason given for him not entrusting himself to them or placing his confidence in them is that he knew all men, and as it says here in verse 25, he knew what was in man. Jesus, the incarnate word. He knows what is in the heart of man, Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. 
tells us that the word of God is swift and it's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. So Jesus, as the incarnate word, understands the thoughts and the intentions of the hearts of men. And for that reason, he does not entrust himself to them. He knew the level of their commitment. And he knew that many were not authentic followers, but rather curious enthusiasts. They were people who were fascinated by the miracles, but they were not following the Messiah. They were attracted to the signs, but they were not aware of their need for a Savior. Jesus knew that many of these same people who were professing him today would, in, 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 in a matter of time, be saying, crucify him, crucify him. The larger point Jesus, that John is making here about Jesus is that Jesus is God. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Bible says, you remember God is speaking to Samuel as he's about to anoint David. He says, don't look at the outward appearance, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man sees at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And since only God knows the heart, and Jesus knows the heart. John is reiterating this basic foundational truth. Remember, he's written his gospel so that we might believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and have eternal life. He is, he is pounding home this one clear fact that Jesus is God. As chapter 3 opens, we find that here is a man of the Pharisees, a man named Nicodemus, and he is coming to Jesus by night. The, the word translated man here picks up on what John has just said about Jesus knowing the hearts of men. Jesus knows everything that's going on in the heart of Nicodemus. And this is a literary clue to the reality that Nicodemus was not a believer. He was one of those people who were interested in, curious about, infatuated with Jesus, but he was not yet a believer. Verse 2 tells us Nicodemus comes by night. Many people try to find some kind of significance in, in him coming to, to Jesus by night. But, I mean, if you've ever been to the Middle East, you know how hot it gets during the day. And so people do a lot of their socializing after dark. And maybe it was because it was a time when they could be left alone and the heat and the, the pressures of the day were not so heavy upon them but he comes when he can have some time with Jesus and Nicodemus begins to question Jesus and he begins by calling him rabbi well isn't that nice I mean here's this upstart from the Galilee and he's prop Jesus is very young and and he, he's gaining a following and here comes Nicodemus who is one of the members of the Sanhedrin he is one of the rulers of the Jews and he's addressing Jesus with the term of rabbi. Now, if it wasn't Jesus, anybody else would say, well, he, he, he thinks I'm special. Jesus is not flattered easily. Jesus is not flattered at all because remember, he knows who he is. He knows who each person is. He says, we know you've come from God as a teacher for no one can do these works that you do unless God is with him. He doesn't say, I know that you are God. He doesn't say that I know that you are the Messiah or God incarnate. He says, you've come from God and God is with you. He's saying, we don't really know who you are. He's, he's, he's stating a question in a declarative form. In a sense, Nicodemus is saying, who really are you? Are you a prophet? Are, are you the Messiah? Are you just a gifted teacher? In the weakness of his address, to Jesus, we, we see the uncertainty in his heart about who Jesus really is and his desire to know who Jesus is. You know, there are a lot of people today who don't really know who Jesus is. They have an idea of who he is. They think they know who he is, but they don't really know who he is. And folks, let me tell you, the most important thing any person can ever come to know is who Jesus is. But there's more to it. Nicodemus and his fellow Pharisees are curious about Jesus. They see the signs. They're, they're, they're political. They see that people are following Jesus, and they want to make sure that this guy doesn't get too large of a following. So maybe Nicodemus was sent by the Sanhedrin to find out what's going on. Who is this guy? Can, can he be controlled? Can we get him on our team? 
The very words of his mouth reveal to us what Nicodemus believes about Jesus. He's a good teacher sent from God, but he is not God, so says Nicodemus. In verse 3, Jesus answered him. And note with me that Jesus doesn't answer the question from his mouth. Jesus speaks directly to the need of his heart. I love that about Jesus. He just cuts to the point. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. To the Jewish mindset, the kingdom of God was representative of heaven, of eternity, of the reward that awaited the righteous. Jesus is saying all of the things that you think can get you to heaven can't do it. You must be born again. Many translations have this rendered born again. The the word in the original language can mean born from above or again. It carries with it this idea of, of, of being born from the top to the bottom. It speaks of a totally new birth, a new life, a spiritual life. Born from above seems to be the best translation, but born again encapsulates it. In his response, Nicodemus demonstrates how clueless he is to what Jesus is talking about. It is interesting where you have people who have a great deal of education, but they cannot grasp the simple things. And why can they not grasp the simple things? Because the Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians 2 that the, the things of God cannot be comprehended by the carnal man. They can only be grasped spiritually. And if, if Nicodemus doesn't understand what's going on, it's because he doesn't have any spiritual life in him. It seems like being born from above is a concept that is foreign to him. In verses 5 and 6, Jesus makes the case for the necessity of spiritual birth. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. If you want spiritual birth, it has to come from God who is a spirit. Flesh cannot give spiritual birth. This reiterates the truth of John 1, 3, which says that, that we must be born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, but, nor the will of man, but of God. Salvation is not something which man can conjure up. It is something God initiates and God completes. One of the things that we need to not miss here, and it's very easy to miss this when you're reading Scripture, is that in every conversation there's body language. Isn't that an interesting thing about wearing masks with all the COVID? You know? We can't see people's expressions. We can't see when they're yawning. We can't see when they're smiling. We can't see when they're not smiling. We can't see if they have food in their teeth. We just can't see anything anymore. But Jesus is not, every conversation is not only verbal, it is physical because there's body language going on. And so Jesus is going to come back and says, don't be amazed. Obviously, he's picked up something in the conversation. And when he talks about being born again, Nicodemus takes a step back. He's like, what, what are you talking about? You see, the thing that would have amazed Nicodemus is not that Jesus said somebody needed to be born again, because Nicodemus as a Pharisee would have said, well, I can point out a lot of sinners. I can show you a lot of people who need that, that, that rebirth you're talking about. But the, the amazing thing to Nicodemus is that Jesus told him he needed to be born again. He saw himself as righteous. He saw himself as, as the one who kept the law. Man, he was the standard. You, and in fact, Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you can't get into heaven. I mean, they kept the rules. They had the rule book. You've heard of those four spiritual laws, a little pamphlet we hand out to help people come to know Jesus Christ. They had the 4,281 spiritual laws. I mean, they had all the rules and regulations. They had everything locked up. If you just do what we do, you're good to go. And so it's shocking. It's shocking to Nicodemus when Jesus says, no, you're not good to go. You need a new birth. You need to be made brand new from the inside out because what you've got isn't going to get you to heaven. There are a lot of religious people today who believe that going to church or knowing Scripture or being born into a Christian family is going to get them to heaven. And they'll say things, well, I've been in Sunday school since I was a child. My dad was a deacon in the church. I grew up at that church. I used to go to vacation Bible school over there. Folks, those things will not get you to heaven. You must be born again. That's what the Scripture says. Now, verse 8 reveals not only that Nicodemus needs to be born again, but why he fails to see his need for this. Don't miss this. He fails to see his need for the new birth, and and Jesus uses the analogy of the wind to describe the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, we could talk all day about the Holy Spirit because most of us as Baptists are afraid of the Holy Spirit. Can I just be honest with you about we'll have an excursus here and step aside. This is free. You don't have to pay extra for this. 
We are afraid of the Holy Spirit because we've seen excesses in some of our charismatic brethren, and we said we don't want any of that, so we've kept the Holy Spirit out of it. But listen to me. It was Roland Allen, who was a missionary to China in in the late 1800s, who said, we don't want the Holy Spirit because he's like a wildfire, and we don't want anything that we can't control. But the Spirit of God moves. The Spirit of God draws people to Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God brings conviction. When the Word of God is preached, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And it is the Spirit of God who changes, transforms people on the inside and gives that new birth. You cannot manipulate this. You cannot manufacture this. You can't work your way into it. It is a sovereign work of God. Jesus is talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. He's he's saying when the Spirit of God blows in your life, and he draws you to conviction, and you come to salvation, there is a transformation that takes place. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It is evident that these new things have not come to Nicodemus. He cannot understand what Jesus is talking about. And so he says, how is this possible? I mean, he's clueless. How is this possible? How can, can, can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? He's thinking so literally here. And, and, and Jesus knows why Nicodemus doesn't understand. The point is he doesn't understand because he doesn't have new life. But here's the thing. Jesus says, you're, you, notice how the table's turned. It, it, as the conversation begins, Nicodemus is going to flatter Jesus and tell him, Rabbi. Now Jesus is the, is the master teacher, and Nicodemus is the, is the student that doesn't quite understand what's being talked about. And he says, how is it that you can be a teacher of Israel, and you don't understand these most rudimentary, basic, elementary things? And you say, well, Pastor, Why would Nicodemus understand this? I mean, this concept of being born again is is a New Testament concept. I beg to differ from you. Listen to what Ezekiel says. Ezekiel 36, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. The concept of new life and new birth is rooted in the Old Testament and I'm going to remind you of this over and over and over again so you don't forget it. The first church didn't have the New Testament. There Bible was the Old Testament and anybody that tells you that you don't need the Old Testament you don't need to listen to and and listen Nicodemus understood the Old Testament he was an Old Testament scholar he spent all his life studying the Old Testament and yet when Jesus talks to him about being born again he just doesn't get it the truth is staring him in the face and he cannot grasp it and why because he's blinded this is why the prophet jeremiah says they have eyes to see but cannot see ears to hear but cannot hear the truth is staring in the face he's standing in the very presence of god incarnate and he doesn't recognize him he's blinded by his religious system blinded by his tradition with the preoccupation of his preconceived idea of what the messiah is going to look like he cannot see the truth In verses 11 and 12, Jesus again turns the table on Nicodemus. Remember back in, Nick, in chapter 2, he started by assuming a position of authority. And now Jesus says, we speak what we know and bear witness of it, but you don't receive our witness. You don't even believe what I'm telling you. Now, folks, I, I want you to recognize something here. When you read the Bible, we have this tendency to see Jesus holding a little lamb and just being Mr. Rogers. Won't you be my neighbor? And he's wearing a cardigan sweater and some loafers. And he's just Mr. Nice Guy. But I want you to be, I want you to understand something. Jesus, he's never rude, he's never unkind, but he is direct and he's to the point, and he calls it like it is. And he tells Nicodemus for his own good. 
Not only must you be born again, you don't even understand. You're a teacher of Israel. You don't understand what I'm talking about. You don't even believe the witness that I'm giving you, that we are giving you. He's, he's speaking in Trinitarian language. You can't understand because you don't believe. If I tell you earthly things, you can't believe them. How are you going to believe spiritual things? I love that because, you know, have you ever met those people? And they're always worried about a new word from God. They just don't want to do the, uh, the old word they already have. I mean, it, if God's already told us what to do and we know what to do, sometimes when we don't like to do it, we go back and say, is there another word, Lord? Is there something else? Can I get another option? Your kids were never like that, were they? Go clean your room. Something else I could do, Dad? <laughs> Jesus says, you, you don't even believe what I'm telling you. So in verse 13, Jesus makes it clear that he alone has come from heaven. See, in Jewish tradition, they believed that Moses ascended into heaven. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Nobody's ascended into heaven. He says, I came down from heaven. The Son of Man has come down from heaven. Jesus says, I am God among you. So when people tell you, well, Jesus never claimed to be God, don't believe them. They just haven't read the Bible. Because the Bible clearly says it. Then in verses 14 and 15, Jesus compares himself to the bronze serpent in the wilderness. Remember in Numbers 21, the children of Israel are going through the wilderness and, and, and God allows serpents to come and bite them and they beg Moses to save them and God has Moses build a, 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 a bronze serpent and put it up on a, on a stick and when they look, we used to have an old hymn that said, look and live, my brother, look and live. And, and, and if they looked at the bronze serpent, they would be cured and they would live. Jesus says that he has to be lifted up and he's talking about his crucifixion. He's talking about when he would die on a cross. And then he moves directly into John 3.16. And we've all heard sermons on John 3.16, haven't you? If you've ever watched a football game, there's somebody holding a sign that says John 3.16. There's some football player that has it right here in black, you know, Greece, John 3.16. We all heard it, but what does it really mean? And oftentimes when we hear John 3.16, we hear the so. God loved the world so much. There's just a problem with that. That the, in the original language, that's, it can be translated as so, but the better translation is in this manner. In this manner. So that, that word translated so is an adverb that speaks to the manner in which something was done. And so instead of speaking about the intensity of God's love, it speaks about the practical nature of God's love, how he manifested that love. And so here's what it's saying. In this manner, God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loved us in a tangible way. He gave his son to be a sacrifice to pay the penalty of our sins. This is the manner of his love. It was salvific. It was pure. It was perfect. It was comprehensive it was complete and it was exactly what we needed when people who have never had the experience of coming to know the love of God begin to contemplate that love the problems they run into are sometimes they think they know what they need rather than what God says they need or their definition of love is deficient rather than understanding God's definition of love Nicodemus thought he simply needed to know who Jesus was if I really know who you are, I can fit you into my system. I can fit you into my thoughts. I, I, can, I can categorize you. I'll know how to think about you. I'll know how to process you. Jesus blows his mind. Jesus says what you need is not, not more understanding. What you need is transformation. You don't need more knowledge. You've got plenty of knowledge. You just need to be born again. His most basic need is spiritual regeneration. And then Jesus goes on to say, listen, God didn't send his, world, his son into the world to condemn the world. The world is condemned already. Folks, listen to me. We have to tell people the bad news before we can explain to them what the good news is. But the reality is we're all born sinners. We're natural born sinners. It's just that way. And we're already under the condemnation of that sin. The world out here, separated from God by sin, they are walking under that condemnation. They don't realize it, so we have to tell them what the Bible says about that. But God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. The world's already condemned, my goodness. 
What I love about this is God didn't love the world the way that we would. He loved the world the way we needed to be loved. He saw our need. The old song someone used to sing says, He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. Isn't that true? When Jesus looks at us, he, rec- he sees right through us. He knows our hearts. Nicodemus needs to be born again. From the foundation of the world, God knew what humanity needed, and he knew that Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, would come because he's the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. I want you to understand something else about this text, and it says that not everybody's going to be saved. There are those, there's two positions here you need to understand, some who are universalists. Let's just call it every dog goes, all dogs go to heaven, okay? And, 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 and there's, there's, there are those who believe that everybody's going to be saved. How, you've heard him say, how can a loving God send anybody to hell? Well, God is not, they, they misunderstand. The fact is, why, the, the love of God is not seen in that. The love of God is seen in that, that God would allow some people not to go to hell. I mean, the grace of God is seen in that any of us could be saved. And the lengths to which God would go to save us from the condemnation that we're already under. So universalists say, well, God's going to get everybody there. And I always like to say, well, does that include Hitler? You've blown their argument. And then there are people who believe in what's called post-mortem evangelism. What they say is, well, yes, if somebody dies lost, after they die, the gospel is going to be presented to them and they're going to have another chance. You know what the problem with that is? That's not what the book says. The Bible says it's appointed for man once to die and after that the judgment. So not everybody goes to heaven. In fact, if left in their own estate, they will go to hell. They have to be born again. And there's no second chance. You either give your life to Jesus in this life. You either surrender to him while you can or once you die, it is too late that's what our text is telling us according to the scripture you have to believe but what is it what does it mean to believe in jesus well it's more than mental assent or intellectual assent to the claims of the gospel of jesus christ it means more than admitting jesus is lord the son of god satan knows who jesus is the bible tells us in the book of james that demons believe and tremble but that belief will not get them saved i heard the story once about a man who said that 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 satan could join almost any baptist church think about it we give an invitation mr satan walks down the aisle and we say satan welcome to kirby woods baptist church uh before we let you join our church we have a few questions for you well ask away do you believe that the Bible is the errant, infallible Word of God. Absolutely. Not one jot, not one tittle is going to fail. I believe every word of it is the Word of God. devil will affirm that all day long. Do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a vicarious death, and rose a glorious resurrection and someday is going to return victorious? Absolutely. I believe that with all of my heart. Do, Do you believe that men are born sinners and will go to hell unless they give their life to Jesus? Absolutely, I believe that. And we'd say, well, you know what? This guy's got pretty good beliefs. He can be a member of our church. Oh, there's one final question, Mr. Satan. Have you ever surrendered your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ and renounced yourself and your sin and made Jesus the Lord, the master, the boss of your life? absolutely not he would say you see you can have all the great beliefs in the world and bust hell right open there are a lot of people who believe the right thing but they've never been transformed by the gospel of jesus christ they've never given their heart and their life to jesus christ that's what jesus is talking about he says that men are lovers of darkness rather than light. They don't want to come into the light because the light exposes them for who they are. So they live in the shadows. The Bible says in Ephesians, they are alienated from the life of God by the darkness that is in them. They're blinded. But the person who comes to Jesus, he doesn't mind coming to the light. 
Because he comes knowing that there's nothing good in him or her. The person who comes to Jesus knows that it's only Jesus that can save us. And so there's a certain amount of humility involved. This is the very heart of the gospel. Times may change, but the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, doesn't change. So how do we apply this to our life? I'm glad you asked. I want to give you three things. The first thing is this text speaks to the inadequacy of man's efforts to save himself. <clears throat> first and foremost, this text says you cannot save yourself. If, if Nicodemus can't get in on good works, there's no hope for you. And he says there's three things that aren't going to cut it. Number one, birth. Probably most shocking to Nicodemus was that as a Jew, he needed to be born again. I mean, you don't understand. You just don't get it. I mean, there's no way we can comprehend it because we haven't been there. But the Jews thought we are God's chosen people. Everybody else is a good-for-nothing Gentile. Downwind, I say. I mean, they really had that attitude. We're Jews. We're God's chosen people. We're something special. We're all going to heaven because we're Jews. <clears throat> Don't let it be lost on you that Jesus is speaking to not only a Jew, but a Jew's Jew. He's speaking to somebody who kept the law fastidiously. It's not sufficient. Being born into a Christian family is not going to get you into heaven. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to. I've asked them, have you ever come to know Jesus Christ? Well, you know, my mama goes to church every week. Or my wife, she takes the kids to church. Or grandma was a Christian. That's not going to get you to heaven. It's kind of like you going to the doctor and he says, you have a very serious illness and you need to take this medicine. Well, can I get my wife to take that for me? Not going to work. See, nobody else can take your medicine for you. You must be born again. Each of us as individuals must be born again. And we as Christians, that is the message that we take. As a church, that's what we're all about. Knowing Jesus means that each and every individual has to be born again. They cannot be born of the flesh into a family that does not need Jesus. Everybody needs to be born again. Secondly, not only can your works, your, your, your birth not that get you there, your good works won't get you there. Nicodemus thought for all the good things he did, man, I want to get to heaven. And can, can I tell you something? That's the natural. Look at all the religions of the world. Look at all the religions of the world. Even in Hinduism, which believes in reincarnation, if, 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 if you were, and they believe you can come back as an ant or a cricket or a snake or whatever, and, and it just depends on how good you are in, the, in this life, how faithful you are to live out your karma in this life as to whether you'll come back reincarnated to something better in the next life. But think about that. That and a lot of other religions are works-based religions. If you're just good enough, then you get the, you get the reward at the end of the day. If I, if I just have a, a good enough heart, if I just do good enough things. I remember going to Egypt several years ago. And I bought a papyrus, and on that papyrus was painted a, a, a scene from the Book of the Dead. And in the Book of the Dead, there is Mott, the god of the underworld in the Egyptian pantheology. And he has a feather, he has a scale before him. And on one side of the scale, he has a feather, and on the other side of the scale is the heart of man. And he's weighing the heart to see if it's lighter than the feather. Because you see, it's your good works, it's your good intentions that gets you into heaven according to their theology. But the Bible says you can't be good enough. We are saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And this is the trap that a lot of people get fall into. A lot of well-intentioned people, a lot of people who are church members. If I'm just good enough, if, if I just keep the rules, if I give enough, if I do enough, I'll get to heaven. And the Bible says that ain't going to cut it. But not only, not only can you not be born into it, not only can you not do enough, you can't know enough. We live in the information age, don't we? If you have a cell phone, you need to start thinking of that cell phone as your brain's external hard drive. Because you know how it works. Oh, man, what is that person's name? What was that? And you just get on Google and all of a sudden, you know. So what happens is we, we have all this information at our fingertips and we think, man, we are smart. We're the smartest people that ever lived. 
We've got all this information. But you cannot know enough to get you into heaven. That was the problem with the Gnostics, one of the early heresies. The word gnosis, from which Gnostic comes from, is a word that means knowledge. They thought if you just have enough knowledge, you're going to get there, you're going to get to the certain place, and if you have the secret word, the secret password, the secret handshake, you get in because you have the right knowledge. And here's what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. You cannot be born into it physically. You cannot do it in good works, and you cannot know enough to get you into heaven. You must be born again. All the things wherein people put their trust will fail them unless they put their trust in Jesus. So this points us to the second thing, and that's the reality of man's need. Here in John's Gospel, Jesus is telling us that to get to heaven, you need to be born again. In fact, verse 7 literally says, it is needful for you to be born from above. This is the necessity of the new birth. This is what every man, woman, boy, and girl needs. How easy is it for us to lose sight of the primary need of humanity? As we live in this world... We are people with passions, we are people with feelings, and we are impacted by what we see and what we feel. So some think, well, what we need is better politicians. There's an oxymoron right there. We need better education, man. If we just educate people and we just we we give them the right environment, they'll rise to the occasion and the, the natural goodness of man will come out. I want you to know one of the most educated societies that ever lived on the planet earth was germany in pre-world war ii how'd that work out you see some people think well what we need is to be nice to each other let's have a group hug and sing kumbaya and you remember in the early some of you i mean i I don't remember that much from the 60s i was just a little kid but, but I can look back, and I remember the Beatles came out in like 1964 with a song that said, all we need is love. Jackie DeShannon came out with a song in 1965, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. And if we, if we could just have a group hug, we could just all get along. We could, we could just, all of our problems would go away, let's just... Let's just hug each other. Let's feel safe. Can I tell you the problem? The problem is we don't have the capacity within us to love one another without the love of Jesus. Because in our fallen nature, in in, in our sinful way, we will corrupt everything. That's what the reformers talked about when they were talking about total depravity. It's not absolute depravity because... Fallen people, sinful people can do some really good things. They're not absolutely depraved. They're totally depraved. That means that every part of us is infected by sin. So what we really need is to be born again. See, a lot of people continue to think physically. They think, well, if we just do the right things, know the right things, go to the right places, then we can get there. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount teaches about this. He says people who put their trust in the wrong things are people who build their house on sand. And then when the storm comes, the storm of God's judgment, and the storm comes, then the the house is, is destroyed, and great is the fall thereof. But the people who believe what Jesus says and put their trust in Jesus and build their life on the solid rock, when the storm comes, they stand. You see, here's the need of every person. And I don't care how long you've been going to church. I don't care how many Bible degrees you have. I don't care how many sermons you've preached or lessons you've taught. If you've never surrendered to Jesus and there's no transformation and there's no fruit flowing from your life, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you need to be born again. But what keeps us from being born again? It's pride, isn't it? I had a professor one time at a Bible school I went to who was preaching a revival and during the invitation he came under conviction and got saved. He had a Ph.D. in Old Testament. He knew more about the Hebrew and the Bible than all of us put together. But the Spirit of God began to convict him and he began to realize, I'm not saved. If I die, I won't go to heaven. And so when the invitation came, he 
he walked forward and got saved. Got saved under his own preaching, but somebody did. <laughs> See, here's the thing, folks. This is where the Scripture says, test yourself to see if you're in the faith. I mean, what Jesus is telling us in, in this text is each of us must be born again. There are only two responses to this. There's not three. There's only two. Because, you see, you can either accept Jesus or reject him. You, you either are born again or you are not. There's just some things that there's no middle ground. You cannot say, well, I kind of accept Jesus. No, if you don't accept him absolutely, you've rejected him absolutely. And so the invitation is this. I mean, if you've never come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is the opportunity to do that, to be born again. It's simple. Well, how simple is it? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John. What does it mean to confess? Well, that Greek word is homologeo. It means say the same thing. To say the same thing about our sin that God says about our sin. You know how we talk about our sin? Well, you know, I've made a few mistakes here and there. I, I've done some things that probably weren't the best. You know how God says about our sin? God says it's going to send you to hell. And it's so bad and it's so destructive that the only way to solve your problem is for somebody to die for you because the wages of sin is death. Well, what do you mean? Well, that's why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come and die on the cross because he got sideways with the Romans or the religious leaders of the day. Jesus didn't come and die on the cross to, to, to set an example for us. Or, are we all going to go die on the cross like that? No, we take up our cross like he did. But no, Jesus came to pay for our sins. We owed a debt we couldn't pay, and he paid a debt he didn't owe. It's not only important for every one of us to know that we've come to know Jesus, and we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, and we've had that transformation. It's important to know what this means so that we as a individuals and we as a church can know that this is what he's called us to do. We do a lot of things as a church. Man, let's meet, greet, and eat. We're going to do this, and we're going to do that, and we're going to have this committee meeting. We're going to, those are, I'm not saying those are bad things. What I'm saying is the number one thing Jesus has called us to do is to make disciples. And we have to be very clear about what that means. That means people are lost and going to hell. And if they don't come to Jesus, they will go to hell. And that means that you and I have been given a stewardship of the gospel. And as we talk about the, the building blocks, the basics of what we are here to do as a church, sharing the gospel, being very clear about the gospel, not just that God has a better plan, but that God has the only plan. If you're here this morning, you've never accepted Jesus, man, now's the time. I'm here. I'd love to talk to you about that. There are deacons here who'd love to talk to you about that. We'd just love to show you what the Bible says. It's as simple as asking Christ to forgive you of your sins. And to be the master of your life, just turning your life over to him, putting your trust in him. Maybe you're here this morning and you realize as an individual, man, you need to be busy about telling other people about Jesus. And this morning, you, God's spoken to you about some people in your life that you know that need to be saved. Now's the time to recommit yourself to being an evangelist for Jesus. To sharing the gospel with other people. Stand with me. And let's have our hymn of response. You come as we sing.